I think one of the joys in gardening is going through the seed catalogs and finding all those new varieties of plants that you're just dying to grow in your garden. But nothing quite compares with collecting seed from your own garden and planting that the next season. Greetings from Hoplong Hollow. This is Jerry. It is mid-September. Today we're going to talk about seeds, collecting seeds, and some fall planting for your garden. I want to put to use this wonderful book that I searched for and found, but I was introduced to it because of my commenters. I think about three of you mentioned the Mary Frances Garden Book and told me that you had this as a child. Now I looked all over for this. I really wanted to find a really nice one in mint condition because this is an old book printed in 1916. And I did end up finding one which is even signed and it's a first edition. So this is Mary Frances Garden Book Adventures Among the Garden People by Jane Airy Fryer. Jane Eyre Fryer did a series of these educational books for children. They're not only educational though, they're colorful, they've got beautiful artwork, they're entertaining and they have some great little characters. I just love beautiful old garden books and I think this is probably one of the most special that I've seen and I'm really, really glad that I was able to find it. So she also has the Mary Frances Cookbook, the Mary Frances Sewing Book, and the Mary Frances Housekeeper. And the subject matter in this book covers everything you can imagine about gardening. So as I said before, this isn't just a book for children. This would be a book for any, any gardener. I think that with the lovely and charming illustrations in this book, which are throughout the entire book, and all the great information on just about every subject when it comes to gardening. There are some charming little characters in here. I'm going to be using this book, I think, now throughout the years in the videos just to show you all that you can learn, even if you're a gardener of vintage years <laughs> like me. So the table of contents speaks for itself. It covers just about every aspect you could think of in gardening. Let's take a couple uh, of subjects here. We've got um, window boxes, Billy test the soil, how to plant, seed babies and their nurses. Oh, we've got the wicked rosebuds, the wildflower garden. We have a car um, articles about um, bees, how do plants grow, all sorts of things. Uninvited guests, we all know who that is. A special feature in this book is a fold-out page which shows you a little cottage, probably a little potting shed, before the garden is put in, and then within the book are four cutouts, each one representing the flowers that would grow in spring, summer, and fall. So these were never cut out, 
which is quite nice. But here we have an early summer hardy garden, which the idea was to cut this little thing out and then place it right there where the potting shed is on that main fold-out page. And on the back you see which of the flowers are represented in this garden for the summer garden. And then here we have oops, the mid-summer garden. And then here we have the autumn garden, early and late fall hardy garden. And then on the back of each of these, would tell it tells you the plants that are put in that garden. There are lots of little charts telling you the botanical name, remarks, the height, etc., germination rates, and so on. So here we are in autumn, and many beginner gardeners may think that by the time the summer's over, then your gardening is done, and that's it. But that nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, some of the best things in this garden grow are started in the fall and that would especially pertain to a lot of vegetables that do not grow here well in the summer because it's simply too hot. Things like broccoli and peas and lettuces and chard, even cilantro just goes to bolt here where we live. It goes to seed because it's simply too hot but to start those seeds in the autumn is a great thing to do. And there are so many hardy annual seeds that you can start, even perennials that you can start in your garden. It'll do a lot better for you if you plant them in the fall. So we're going to start out with seeds today because seeds to me are the most remarkable of little creatures. So let's refer to Mary Frances' garden book here, talking about seed babies and their nurses. And of course, I know this sounds very juvenile, but I think it's a wonderful way to explain seeds. So here I am reading from Mary Frances. First of all, we must understand that the seed has a coat which holds the living, sleeping baby. You see, the baby itself is so tiny and delicate that it would not be safe for it to be out without its seed coat. The wind and the sun would soon dry it up and kill it. And then, too, it would die of hunger, for it's too little to find its own food. So its mother wraps the baby up in its strong seed coat and puts its food in beside it in the same coat. And there the seed baby lies sound asleep until, until everything is just right for it to wake up. The time it likes best to awaken is in spring, when the weather is getting warm. Now in the case of the seeds we'll be planting today, and many that we've collected, these seeds don't necessarily like to waken up in the spring. They like to wake up in the fall, you can actually get them started growing in the fall. And they can even thrive growing in the snow and in the winter. And be covered in the snow and still be just fine because that's what we're concentrating on today. Collecting seed and planting seed that likes to be sown in the autumn and the winter. You can see a variety of different seeds of all sizes and shapes, but they all have the same thing in common. They need moisture in order to soften that seed coat in order for all the rest of the miraculous events to take place. And really, truly, when you plant a seed, just think about how incredibly miraculous that really is. You might look at things a little bit differently when those seedlings start to come up, when you realize how amazing this is. So let's go back to Mary Frances. She says the baby begins to eat the food that its mother put inside the seed coat. It stretches itself and pretty soon it sends down into the earth a teeny weeny rootlet. The rootlet takes a little food from the earth up to the baby. Oh yes, plant soup. That is the kind of food it takes. Plant soup is mixed earth and water. How good it is for the plant child depends on how sweet the soil is, how much humus or compost or manure food is in the soup. Humus soup tastes wonderfully good to the baby plant. So here we are. We are sending down our little rootlet. Our tiny stem grows upward and bursts through the seed coat and shows two tiny leaves. They are not the true leaves of the plant baby, but are the nurse leaves, which go ahead of the leaves of the baby plant and really hold the true leaf of the baby between them. 
So the nurse leaves, take care of, and feed the tiny plant baby until it can send out its own tiny leaves to gather air and digest food for itself. Isn't that absolutely fascinating? I think we can leave it at there, but I think you can appreciate seeds and what they do a lot more when you actually understand the process of what's going on. So I think we're going to collect some seeds, just a few, and then we're going to go and plant some things in the garden. Today we're going to be working in the potager, one of my favorite gardens because it changes so much through the seasons. This beautiful little dwarf cosmos has got the easiest seeds to collect. As you can see, they just turn into this sort of like a starburst. And you just take them in your fingers and you pull them off and they just come right off, just like that. And you just gather them together. And before you know it, you have got an entire jar full of seeds. Now, of course, some of these will drop right into the garden, self-seeding. But if I let all of them self-seed in this garden, it would be nothing but cosmos next year. And I'd only want them to grow along the border here. We've been able to collect a jelly jar full of seeds, and there are a lot more where that came from. Now, I don't want them self-sowing in this garden, as I said, because then I would just be inundated with these cosmos. Now, cosmos are a hardy annual. Hardy annuals are self-seeders, so they will keep going in your garden for as long as you will have them. And there are many hardy annuals. These are wonderful to sow directly in the garden in the fall because they're hardy for the simple reason that they can maintain their life cycle. Even in the cold, I have seen hardy annuals thriving when the weather gets super cold and there's actually snow on the ground. This clematis is ready to have its seed gathered. And this is, I love these beautiful swirls. They're so beautiful. But if you just gently, that one's not ready. Because the seed, when it's ready, it will just come right out. Something special about collecting seeds from your own garden. Now this is from the balloon flowers that I planted about the same time last year in the front yard garden. Now, after they bloom, I let the heads, the seed heads, get to about this color. Then I cut them off and I just let them drop in the garden. A lot of them will simply scatter seed on their own like this. And many more I will bring in and separate the seed from these dried seed heads. Here you can see all three stages of the development of the seeds. So here we have the balloon flower. This is the second time it's bloomed this, season, this year. And you can see all the little developing buds right here. So we'll still get some more flowers off of this one. And that's because I popped the seed heads off before they dried out so that it could bloom twice. Anyway, here we have the developing seed pods which I will just leave on this time until they're dried out, then I'll collect them. When we first pull these seeds off the plant, they're rather close on top. But the longer they dry, the more that little center opens up, and that is what's going to release the little seeds that are in tiny compartments, just beautiful little symmetrical compartments inside each seed head. And as the wind blows, or the seeds drop into the soil, they simply pour right out of this, like a salt shaker. Just like this. Look at all those little seeds you have. Look at all those potential plants. I think seeds are so wonderful. I'm just always fascinated by them. They're just one of the easiest plants to collect seed from. Some plants are pretty, pretty straightforward. After you've um, picked your plant, whether you picked it and put it in a vase, it doesn't matter. If you put it in a vase and you let it dry out, you can still get the seed from it. So here's one, I believe this was in a vase. And otherwise, if you leave it on the stem in the garden for any length of time, just wait till they turn brown like this. Or you can pluck them off and just toss them in a garden or a bucket, leave them out in the sun until they get all crispy and crunchy like this. And then you are just going to take the petals. When they're ready, they'll come right off. And you're going to pull the petals. And there on the end, you can see those beautiful little zinnia seeds right there. You want to 
break them off the petals, lay them on a nice piece of newspaper or parchment paper, and let them dry for a couple days so they're thoroughly dry. And then you want to put them in an airtight container or a little envelope and mark them. Keep your seeds in a cool, dark place. If you keep your seeds in a place with a lot of heat, the heat is going to try to germinate your seeds and your seeds will just simply not stay viable. Now, zinnias are such great self-seeders, so if you want to keep those zinnias in place in the same garden, just let them reseed themselves and you will have zinnias for as long as you want them. Or save the seed for another garden. One thing to keep in mind when you're collecting seed is if you want to preserve the purity of a particular plant, you have to know whether it's cross-pollinated or self-pollinating. Here's an example. This is a beautiful butter, butter yellow petals on the zinnia, which is why I purchased these seeds in the first place. Because all the seeds in the packet are either this beautiful pale yellow, white, or green tinged white petals. And that's what I bought these for. So if I want to preserve the seed and keep these same colors, and it's a cross-pollinator, in other words, this was pollinated by insects, bees, moths, butterflies. They are cross-pollinating this zinnia if this color is in the garden as well. This is going to be the dominant color in the seeds. The darker is going to be the dominant seed. So if you're trying to preserve the purity, like I said, of a plant, you want to stick with one particular color. So to preserve these colors, in this particular garden, which was the Maiden's Garden, I only planted this variety of zinnias. So here I've got these beautiful little pale green, whitish, the pale butter yellow, and then this, well, it's also like little pale green. So now when I collect these seeds, the plants that come out of those should be the same colors as these. Seed from the coneflower is not quite so straightforward. With the coneflower, it takes about five to six weeks after the flower has bloomed. The best way to do this, and you have to really have good timing, is to wait until the flower heads, the seed heads, turn gray right there in the garden. And then you gotta go get them before the birds do because the seeds are going to be right in the center of the flower head. These obviously weren't ready when I picked them, but and uh, you gotta get to these before the birds do. With coneflower seeds, they don't stay viable for very long, so you want to get those as soon as they're ready, as soon as they're mature, and that might take a little bit of practice to figure out when that time is. I know I'm not absolutely an expert on it, that's for sure. It was very serendipitous that as I was making this video on collecting seed, and I was just about to talk about collecting the coneflower seed, one of you sent me a couple baggies full of coneflower seeds and well, that's fantastic because mine are not really to, ready to collect yet but these are perfect to give you a showing of how to get the coneflower seed. Really serendipitous is the fact that she sent me colored these different colored coneflowers heads because this is what I really want to collect. I have a lot of purple coneflowers that just drop seed where the, wherever they will but these are the collector colors that I really, really want. So look at uh, the bottom of the bag. You can see that much of the seed has already fallen down to the bottom. But let's get a head and pull one of these out and see if anybody has any seed still to give to us. So we're just going to take the head and there we go. See, it's already got little bitty white, the, they're the whitish grayish seeds. The black stuff, that's just chaff. But we do have plenty of seeds left in this one. And all I'm doing is sort of scraping back the little spikes of the coneflower. And out comes that wonderful, wonderful seed. Oh, this is exciting because this is the red coneflower. And if it's true, I will end up with a lot of red coneflowers in the garden. Just look at all the seed from about six coneflower heads. Now, some of this is chaff. That would be the black 
the black skinny pieces, but it's easy to tell the seed from the chaff. That's really a lot of seed right there. This garden turned out to be pretty striking, and this was this is the Peabody Boy Garden, the one right in front of the peacock perch. Most of these were bedding plants or planted from seeds. Now the exception are these absolutely striking cone flowers, which aren't even in the ground yet. I picked these up yesterday in pots because they had a deal on them. And look at these absolute stunners. I love cone flowers anyway, but these new hybrids of cone flowers are just out of this world. This is called the Siesta series, and this one, oh wait, is this a sombrero? Siesta series, I think. This one is called Baja Burgundy. Look at these magnificent colors. This one's called Mellow Orange, and I'm not really one that likes orange flowers, but this has got to be the exception to the rule. And what I love about coneflowers is the top, the spiky round heads on the top, and that's where the seeds are going to be. And I am thrilled to be able to collect seeds from these in the, in the fall. Now the problem with this is these are cross-pollinated. Here's a perfect example of a little bee that will be cross-pollinating. He'll be taking pollen from this red coneflower and depositing it upon another coneflower, most likely. And so he's cross-pollinating these plants. So when I collect the seed, I'm not necessarily going to get the same colors here. But I could get some pretty striking combinations. <laughs> Who knows? Of course, these original mother plants will come back just as they are. But I am really, and then look at that great big beauty in the back. I needed something to finish off this garden because a lot of the small plants that I put in are still, still pretty small. Like the golden yarrow down here is still not producing any flowers yet, but this will grow all the way through the winter. This likes the cold weather actually. And so I think next year this garden will be absolutely tops. Right off the porch, we're about ready to go into the potager and put some of these things into practice and plant some of these seeds that have been collected, not just this morning, but over the last couple weeks I've been gathering seed. This garden has already been, re all the um, summer items have been removed out of here. The vegetables, the, the peppers, everything that was growing, the summer crops, they're gone. I pulled them up and I've started all over again with autumn sown vegetable seeds. Here on the potting porch, right next to the potager, I have used several of my mini nursery beds just to sow several of these hardy annuals and hardy perennials. Just to see how long it takes them to germinate. Basically, this is more of an experiment than anything. I could just as easily sow these right into the ground right now. But I wanted to see what the germination rate would be. And so far, clary sage germinated in about two days. The English daisies germinated in about three days. The dwarf foxglove, not doing much so far, but it is a biennial and it might take a little bit longer. And here we have a giant paper daisy. These also were pretty quick germinators. It's sort of, for me, an, a, an experimental thing to do before I actually directly seed. It gives me a good idea of what time frame we're looking at to get things growing. I'm pretty proud of my little spooky pumpkins here because I planted these from seed, just I think one plant, and I've never gotten pumpkins to grow. I'm serious. Supposed to be one of the easiest things in the world. This is my first little batch of pumpkins and I'm so proud of these little pumpkins and every one of these will probably be turned into pumpkin soup. But these was, this was called spooky pumpkin. And so, and I've also got about nine more of them on the vine, so that's pretty exciting. Here I'm trying some rose cuttings. We'll see how they go. This is the time to take them. We'll talk about that in the next video. And here we have 
my improper flower arrangements. I don't make proper flower arrangements, as I've said before. Mine just kind of grow like a wild garden in a rusty can. I mean it. These really are rusty cans. I think it makes the flowers even more beautiful when the container is sort of out of whack. This little, um, this raised bed is three foot by eight foot, and it's always so useful for me. I can do so many things in this one strip. Now, I've cleared it out of everything that was in it, so I had a lot of beets growing here in the front, and garlics in the back, and I actually have daffodil bulbs by the gazillions here that I pulled out of this bed, because it's also a spring ornamental bed. So I've got a whole basket of elephant garlic and some huge daffodils and muscaris and crocuses and all sorts of bulbs here. Well, I don't know if I want to put all of them back in here, but I definitely want to use the elephant garlic, take a lot of it in the house for usage, but then I will set aside several of the bulbs to grow in the very back because elephant garlic gets so tall. And then I'm going to do a couple other things all the way to the front of the bed. I have three rusty items, which are old chicken feeders. Not much good for holding chicken feed anymore because they rusted out on the bottoms. But they are pretty good for holding soil and allowing the water to drain out after you've given your plants a good watering. So I've decided to put a lot of those mystery bulbs in these old chicken feeders. I think they're really interesting. I can get them in pretty easily between these slats. And the roots don't go very deep on the bulbs. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with these. I think they'll be um, beautiful. I'm pretty sure this is muscari. But I've got some little allium bulbs in there. I'm pretty sure of that too. And they'll just come popping up and shooting up through the tops of these chicken feeders. And they'll be able to be moved anywhere in the garden, wherever they might make a little bit of interest. So that's what I'm going to do with these rusty items. The beautiful thing about muscari and daffodil bulbs is that they just multiply like crazy. I'm pretty sure these are called ocean blue muscaris. And I think they'll be wonderful coming up in this rusty old chicken feeder. But... I just love the bulbs of the daffodils and the muscaris and the alliums because they do multiply, whereas that just cannot be said about tulip bulbs. This has been completely planted, this strip. So there in the back, elephant garlic and then a row of large daffodils. In front of that, the calendula. The calendula is an apricot pink color and it's right here down the center and the seeds have germinated. These like to be winter sowed. These are a hardy annual. The Swiss chard likes the cold weather, and here the Swiss chard seed is coming up, and in front of that, lettuce. So it seems like a jam-packed bed, and it will be pretty crowded in here. I easily call this Potache the Rusty Garden, because all the props and containers that I use, and most of the fencing, is rusty and old. And that would be the trellises, the arbors. I just think that the contrast of the rust with beautiful growing things, especially elegant growing roses, is really interesting and beautiful. So here I have planted the wire is to keep the wild birds from coming in and getting the seed I just laid down and I'll be able to lift that up pretty soon. But see, already these little these little beets are coming up. And all around this I've planted purple king pole beans to climb up. This old weather vane. And over here, right down the center, I planted Clary sage, which is supposed to be really good to plant with your vegetables. Also, calendula. Here we have some patio peas. 
and these went in a couple days ago and I can see right now there's a little pea right there I had a little squirrel digging in here this morning and he I think got a couple of these peas also I have a chipmunk that lives in this garden that's probably not a great thing to have a chipmunk living in your potager but I cannot resist him he's so cute and every morning I look out the window and there he is running around the timbers on here looking for something he's getting over there I just can't imagine Most of all, he's looking for those mealy worms that fall out of the bird feeder and some sunflower seeds that also come out of there and they land on the ground and he just comes over here and has his breakfast. So he can't do too much damage. Tomato plant's just about ready to pull out, but I think it's going to give a little more fruit. So I'll wait till these are done. But in the meantime, there are some sugar sprint peas planted down here and I don't see those yet nope there's one I see one I might have to come in and replant we talk about nursery beds many times I have several things troughs and old wash buckets and that sort of thing that I'll use as what I call nursery beds and I will sprinkle my seeds in here that like the cold weather, that want to start germinating and growing through the colder months. So here we have hollyhock seeds just sprinkled right on the top of this nursery bed just about two or two days ago. So they haven't done anything yet. Just keep them wet. Keep your seeds wet until they germinate and then keep an eye on them. Let them stay moist. And then when these are fairly established, I might have to thin them out. I'll let them grow to about three or four inches, then I'll thin them out, and then I will actually let them grow here all winter long, and then in the spring transfer them to a garden. More hardy annuals in here, some herbs. So here I've sprinkled some chamomile seed not that long ago. Little chamomiles are starting to come up. They're ever so tiny now. But if you look very closely, you can see them. And you can also see the chives that are growing in this garden. So this is a modge podge of chamomile, pink primrose for beauty, chives for food and beauty. And then over here we have oregano. So this little pocket is very pretty all winter long. In the corner we have some more rust, which is this old wash tub, double wash tub, which I use for all sorts of things. It always seems to change. But I decided this is where I would drop all of the mystery bulbs that came out of that long bed. And this is where they ended up. This should be pretty interesting because I planted this in a lasagna style, whereas the larger bulbs were all closer to the bottom, about here, then a load of compost and then the medium sized bulbs were here and then up on top we have the very tiny bulbs. This is probably the, probably muscari. Most likely I'm pretty sure that's muscari. And maybe there's some chives in here. I'm not quite sure but these were the tiny bulbs. So this will be a beautiful and interesting spring display. And all winter long these will grow and so there's some more interest in your garden for over the colder months. And then here we have broccoli, which is also a cool weather crop. These are supposed to get about 30 inches tall. And growing behind them is okra, which I don't even remember planting the okra. There's not enough here to even pickle. But I'm gonna I'm gonna let these go to seed, and I'm going to collect the okra seed from these. I saw one bloom the other day. Oh, they have the most wonderful flower blooms on them. They're just almost exotic looking. And behind that, on this vine, is a cool weather crop. Basically, this is a tiny miniature watermelon plant. And I don't know when I'm supposed to harvest those, but they are mini watermelons. I think they get about, mm, I don't know, maybe 10 inches long. 
not very big so that should be very interesting but I think this is very pretty but since these will be gone probably by the end of October behind that I will plant another row of winter peas to climb up this rusty headboard makes a great trellis going to hope that my broccoli does better over the autumn months and the cold months than it does in the summer. It's just pretty hopeless here to plant broccoli in the summer. It simply doesn't make it. It never does. It either gets eaten up by worms or it goes to seed before it ever produces nice big healthy heads. So we'll give it a go in the autumn. Here in this bed we have been, I'm separating three separate beds with this old cast iron fencing, starting with arugula, which loves the cold weather. Here it'll grow all the way through the winter in January, February, March, but in summer it will just bolt and it will just not grow for me at all. And then in the second row we have leeks and on the very end we have spinach, another cold weather crop. The strawberry beds always stay green and healthy no matter what time of year it is, but it's not what I'm concentrating on right now. I want to think about this other piece of rust, which is another rusty headboard. Makes a fantastic trellis, and I think that what I want to put on here will be everlasting sweet peas. This is the time to plant them. They like the cold. Parsley and cilantro are two herbs that you can winter sow. Now, parsley is a very pokey germinator. It takes 20 to 28 days to germinate. And what I always do is I write a tag out to let me know what that germination rate is on the plant so that I don't get too frustrated and just dig everything up thinking it's never going to grow. But it's just a good idea to mark your markers with not only the name of the plant, but also the date you planted it and the germination time. You're going to start seeing the cone flowers appearing in the garden centers, and that's because that's when you want to put them in. They are perennials, and this is the great best time in the world to get them in the garden. Over the winter, they'll develop nice, deep, healthy roots. So even if they don't look so great, and even if they've already bloomed and you see them there in the garden center for a good price, if you like coneflowers, pick some up, because, I mean, the heads are just as beautiful as anything. But you will allow that plant to grow in your garden all winter long, and even though you won't be able to see it, because all the foliage will die down to the ground, there's that plant underneath there just growing and growing and getting healthier and stronger. And in the spring and summer, you'll have a beautiful bunch of coneflowers. Well, it's getting a little bit dark out here, but I wanted to do one final clip in another nursery bed, which you've seen many times. This is the old horse trough that I use for so many things. Tulip bulbs, sweet peas, all sorts of things. But this is a wonderful nursery bed for the autumn and winter sowing. Sweet peas are ready to go in along the back and along the front. I will just generously sprinkle biennial foxglove seed. I will be very, very generous with it and I will have tiny little foxgloves growing all throughout this bed in the next several weeks. I'll keep them here all winter until they're ready to transplant into the gardens in the spring. Right now, there are morning glories and purple hyacinth beans growing up the vines, and for some strange reason, we've got zinnias growing in here. But it's a very useful bed, and I'm sorry this video went on so long. I actually wanted to talk about hardy annuals and sowing a lot of uh, old-fashioned flowers, such as your poppies, your larkspur, your bachelor buttons and so on, but that will have to wait until our next video. <laughs> the donkeys are getting um, anxious for their afternoon treat. So for now, I will say goodbye from Hopalong Hollow and we'll see you next time.